Hello, everyone. Today, Michelle and I will give an introduction and update to Kubernetes Seek Storage. My name is Xinyang. I work at VMWell in the cloud storage team. I'm also a co-chair in Seek Storage, along with Sad Ali from Google. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I'm a tech lead for Seek Storage. Um, and then um, uh, also uh, Jan, uh, from Red Hat is another tech lead in SIG storage. So our session today will include two parts. In the first half, we will give an introduction. In the second half, we will give an update and deep dive. In the introduction, I'm going to talk about some basic concepts in Kubernetes storage and how to get involved. First, I'll talk about persistent storage. Kubernetes storage provides a way for containers in the pods to consume block or file storage. Persistent storage is one type of storage that lives beyond a pod's life cycle. The terminologies we heard most in SIG storage are probably PVC, PV and storage class. PVC, persistent volume claim, is a user space object. It is a request by a user for storage. A PV, persistent volume, is a cluster scope object. It represents a physical volume on the storage system. A PVC and a PV have a one-on-one -on -one mapping. Storage class is in the cluster scope. It is a way for admin to describe the classes of storage. Different classes might map to different quality of service levels or other admin-defined policies. In dynamic provisioning, storage class is used to find out which provisioner should be used and what parameters should be passed to the provisioner when creating the volume. A pod is a group of one or more containers with shared storage and network resources and a specification for how to run the containers. A pod is a user space object. A PVC is used by a pod. In static provisioning, a cluster admin creates a number of PVs which carry the details of the real storage. The control plane can bind the PVCs to PVs in the cluster. However, if you want a PVC to bind to a specific, specific PV, you need to pre-bind them. When none of the static PVs the admin created match a user's PVC, the cluster may try to dynamically provision a volume, especially for the PVC. This provisioning is based on storage classes. The PVC must request a storage class and the admin must have created and configured that class for dynamic provisioning to occur. Here is an example of a pod, PVC, and a storage class. The pod is using the PVC. PVC has capacity, access modes, it is a read-write once here, and storage class name specified here. In the storage class, there is a provisioner that determines what volume plugin is used for provisioning PVs. The reclaim policy is retained. This means the PV will remain along with the physical volume on the storage system when the user deletes the PVC. If the reclaim policy is deleted, the PV along with the physical volume will be deleted when the user deletes the PVC. Allow volume expansion is true, so volume expansion can be requested by the user here. And volume binding mode is uh, immediate in the storage class. Immediate means volume binding and dynamic provisioning occurs once the PVC is created. However, this may result in unschedulable pods. A cluster admin can address this issue by specifying the wait for first consumer mode, which will delay the binding and provisioning of a PV until a pod using this PVC is created. Storage class also has parameters that are storage provider specific and opaque to Kubernetes. 
Next, I'm going to talk about ephemeral storage. Ephemeral storage becomes available when the pod is started and goes away when the pod goes down. We have local ephemeral storage, such as empty dir secrets, config maps, and downward APIs. And we have a CSI ephemeral volumes and generic ephemeral volumes. An empty dir volume is first created when a pod is assigned to a node and it exists as long as that pod is running on that pod, that, that, that pod is running on that node. As the name suggests, the empty dir volume is initially empty. All containers in a pod can read and write the same files in the empty dir volume, though that volume can be mounted at the same or different paths in each container. When a pod is removed from a node, the data in empty dir is deleted permanently. And empty dir is usually used as scratch space. A secret volume is used to pass sensitive information such as passwords to pods. You can store secrets in the secrets Kubernetes API and mount them as files for use by pods. Secret volumes are backed by tempfs, so they are never written to non-volatile storage. Uh, the next one is a config map. A config map provides a way to inject non-confidential configuration data into pods. When referencing a config map, you provide the name of the config map in the volume. In this example here, the config map is mounted as a volume and all contents are mounted into the pod at the path derived from the mount path and the key in the config map. Here's an example of the downward API volume. It makes downward API data available to the applications it amounts a directory and writes the requested data in plain text files. In the support YAML file, you can see that the pod has a downward API volume and the container mounts the volume at a specified location. Each element and items is a downward API volume file. The first element specifies that the value of the pod's metadata labels field should be stored in a file named labels. Now I'm going to talk about CSI inline ephemeral volume. In this example here, we set volume type to CSI in pod inline definition and specify the driver name and volume attributes. For a CSI driver to support CSI ephemeral volumes, it must be modified or implemented specifically for this purpose. A CSI driver is suitable for CSI ephemeral inline volume if it serves a special purpose and needs custom per volume parameters like drivers that provide secrets to your pod. The secret store CSI driver is a good example. A CSI driver is not suitable for CSI ephemeral inline volumes when provisioning is not local to the node or when ephemeral volume creation requires volume attributes that should be restricted to an admin, for example, parameters in a storage class. Next, I'm going to talk about generic ephemeral volume. The generic ephemeral volume feature allows any existing storage driver that supports dynamic provisioning to be used as an ephemeral volume with the volume's lifecycle bound to the pod. It can be used to provide scratch storage that is different from the root disk. For example, um, persistent memory or a separate local disk on that node. All storage class parameters for volume provisioning are supported. All features supported with, CS, uh, with the PVCs are supported, such as storage capacity tracking, snapshotting, cloning, and volume resizing. This feature is beta since 1.21 release, and it is targeting GA in 1.23. Now 
Next, I'm going to talk about volume plugins. Kubernetes volume plugins include entry plugins, auto tree flex volume, and CSI drivers. Some entry plugins, such as those FMR ones I mentioned earlier, will stay in tree. But most other entry plugins are either deprecated or are migrating to CSI drivers. Michelle will talk more about it later. Flex volume is deprecated. CSI driver is the recommended way to write plugins. The Kubernetes implementation of the container storage interface, CSI, has been GA since the 1.13 release. CSI is designed to be vendor neutral, interoperable, and has a focus on specification. It defines a set of storage interfaces so that a storage vendor can write one plugin and have it work across a range of container orchestration systems. In the CSI spec, we have RPCs for volume lifecycle management. This includes provisioning support, such as create and delete volume, and RPCs that make sure volumes are available for a pod to use, such as attach and detach volume and mount and unmount volume. It also has other functions such as expand volume, snapshotting, cloning, volume health, and so on. Here is an example of a CSI deployment. It shows various Kubernetes components, the CSI driver, and the storage system that is used to persist the data. Here we have Cube Controller Manager on the master node. CSI driver controller plugin is deployed together with Kubernetes CSI external provisioner, external attacher, external resizer, and external snapshotter sidecars. Note that CSI driver controller pod does not have to run on the same node as the Kubernetes master, but is recommended to run on dedicated control plane nodes. The Kubernetes CSI sidecars are watching Kubernetes API objects such as PVCs, PVs, volume attachments, volume snapshots to detect create volume, attach volume, volume expansion, and volume snapshot requests. The sidecars call the CSI driver, and the CSI driver communicates with the storage system to complete those volume operations. On Kubernetes worker nodes, we have Kubelet and the CSI driver node plugin deployed together with the node driver registrar sidecar container. Node driver registrar fetches driver information using node get info from CSI endpoint and registers the CSI driver with the kubelet on that node. Kubelet directly issues CSI node get info, node stage volume, and node publish volume calls against the CSI drivers to get info and mount volumes. That's all for the basic Kubernetes storage concepts. Next, I will talk about how to get involved. Here I included the SIG storage community page. It has a lot of information to get you started. We have bi-weekly meetings on Thursdays where we go through features we're tracking for each Kubernetes release and discuss any design issues or other issues added to the agenda doc. This is a good place for a new contributor to get started, join the meeting and see how the SIG works, what you are interested in and get assigned to work on some tasks. The communication within the SIG is through the mailing list or Slack channel. Here I included some resources for your reference. Here are docs that explain what the Kubernetes storage concepts and what is CSI. The last reference is an example to deploy the sample CSI host pass driver. For a new contributor who wants to contribute code, uh, it's good to follow the, this example and learn how CSI works. That's all for the introduction. I'm handing it over to Michelle for the SIG storage update. Thank you, Xing. Um, so for the SIG storage update, I'm going to um, deep dive into a couple of um, major efforts that have been going on in the SIG for the last couple of releases. Um, and then 
Um, I'll give a summary of, um, of projects that we have promoted in the 122 timeframe uh, and talk about things, some things that we're working on in 1.23 and also things that um, are currently in design prototyping phases and then um, other projects that we are working with other SIGs on. Um, so first in a deep dive, uh, I'll, I'll talk about CSI migration. Um, the, to give some background on why we are doing CSI migration, um, the Kubernetes project has deprecated all of the built-in cloud providers, and the project is targeting to remove these cloud providers starting in uh, 1.24. So work has been uh, going on for a lot of releases now to decouple the cloud-specific controllers in Kubernetes from the core Kubernetes uh, engines. And now that effort is finally approaching um, a point where we can confidently switch over to the external cloud provider model. Um, however, Persistent volumes have an especially interesting problem because the cloud specific volume types are built directly into the core Kubernetes volume APIs. And the Kubernetes APIs have very strict backwards compatibility policies that make it difficult to, to modify or remove support for um, the API. So, what we've come up with is the CSI migration project. Basically, it allows you to continue using any existing PVs and storage class objects that you have today that are referencing the legacy volume APIs, um, even when the cloud provider controllers are removed from the core of Kubernetes. How this works is underneath the covers, Kubernetes will actually translate the legacy API into the new CSI API, and it will redirect any volume operations that would have normally gone to the um, uh, entry controllers to the equivalent CSI driver. So, um, oh, sorry, if you go back a page. Um, currently, the following entry volume types have a beta implementation of CSI migration that you can enable today in your clusters. Um, and the plan is for these uh, specific plugins, uh, CSI migration features to be GA'd in 1.24. So we have um, AWS EBS, Azure Disk, Azure File, uh, OpenStack Cinder, GCE PD, and vSphere volumes. All right, so uh, moving on. Um, what do you need to do to actually turn on CSI migration? So the answer depends on whether or not you're using a managed Kubernetes distribution or if you are um, managing your own or creating and managing your own cluster. So if you're ma using a managed Kubernetes distribution, um, you will need to double check the documentation for your distro to see how they're handling the CSI migration um, and if there's any steps they might require you to do. But in most cases, actually, the distro should be taking care of everything to enable the feature, um, including installing the CSI driver. So um, you for those for it, so if you're using a managed distribution, you very likely won't have to do anything to um, enable the feature, but it's good to double check. Um, just to be sure. Um, now, if you are um, managing your own Kubernetes flavor, then um, there are a, a couple of steps that you need to do to turn on the feature. Um, first of all, uh, you will need to install the replacement CSI driver into your cluster. Um, and once you do that, then um, you'll have to enable uh, the Kubernetes feature gates um, in a pretty specific order, um, which is documented in, in the link below. Um, and so 
uh, please take a look if, if you're in this boat to, to look at um, exactly the uh, ordering sequence uh, of enabling these feature gates. Um, so there are some caveats with this feature. Um, even though it is using CSI under the covers, you will not be able to use uh, CSI only functionality uh, with the legacy API objects, uh, such as snapshots or cloning. Um, the main purpose of CSI migration is to make sure you have feature parity with the legacy APIs. Um, and it's not, the purpose is not to provide sort of for, forward looking feature compatibility. Um, so if you do need to use the newer CSI features, then um, I think instead of using CSI migration, you will have to manually re-import the PV object as an equivalent CSI volume type um, so that you can use CSI directly in your cluster. Um, another caveat is that some drivers have some uh, sort of corner case and uncommon functionality that is not uh, going to work with CSI migration. Um, we have identified most of these behaviors and have already deprecated these behaviors in, in Kubernetes. So please take a look at the Kubernetes release notes um, with the uh, specific drivers you're using in mind to, to see if you are depending on any of these behaviors. Um, we especially encourage everyone to try out the feature in their own dev environments uh, first uh, to help us make sure that you know there's no major issues and that we catch um, you know we catch in any surprises before uh, we end up GAing the feature in Kubernetes and removing the cloud providers. All right, so that's um, most that's mainly uh, CSI migration in a nutshell. Um, I think, yeah, basically this is coming soon um, over the next uh, release or two. So please uh, take a look if you're uh, in a working in a cloud environment and using a cloud volume plugin. And please reach out to us if you have any uh, questions or concerns about the feature. All right. Um, so the next feature I'm going to uh, talk about is CSI Windows. Uh, this feature GA'd in 1.22. Um, and so to deal with the uh, lack of Windows privilege container support, um, the, the team has created this binary called CSI proxy. It runs as a service on every host and CSI drivers will communicate with it through gRPC to perform any privilege operations that it needs to do, such as uh, formatting disks and mounting disks. Um, the, currently, it supports uh, operations uh, for NTFS-based uh, file systems, uh, Samba, and then um, iSCSI support is available in Alpha as well. And there's a couple of drivers, uh, known drivers that um, have already implemented support for the uh, CSI proxy API. Um, I put a, so I did put a little asterisk next to um, the mention about um, no uh, privilege containers support in Windows. Um, that's because in 122, there's actually a new alpha feature that will allow privileged containers in Windows. So um, what does that mean for the future of CSI proxy? Um, I think if, the, if this new alpha feature for privileged containers goes well, uh, and you know, it, it matures to beta and GA statuses, then you know, we can look, you know, we can then remove the need for CSI proxy. And uh, instead of, uh, the CSI proxy client um, doing gRPC calls, um, the CSI proxy client could instead just turn into a library call 
um, to make various uh, direct uh, calls to the Windows uh, system. And so um, I think with that plan, it also makes the migration uh, between this CSI proxy model to a library model um, more seamless for drivers uh, because the APIs will still remain uh, the same or at least significantly the same. <clears throat> so if, um, if you are writing a CSI driver and you want to support Windows, I'm sorry, it, it, if you're uh, writing a CSI driver and you want to support Windows, um, please take a look at CSI proxy and also um, go, uh, go ahead and if you have questions, uh, there's a CSI Windows uh, Slack channel where you can you know, ask questions or you know, if you want to help out with the project, that's also great too. All right, <clears throat> so I think that's it for um, the deep dives on uh, some of the major features that we have uh, been working on over the last uh, couple of releases. Um, I'm just gonna show a list of all of the features that we graduated in 122, and I'm going to highlight a couple of them. Um, so graduating to GA, uh, I think like we mentioned, um, we have CSI windows. Um, and then we have this other uh, feature called passing the pod service account to a CSI driver. Um, this is a very important feature for any CSI driver authors out there, as this allows CSI drivers to authenticate on behalf of the pod. So this feature allows you to be able to support per pod ACLs um, on your uh, volumes or, or whatever um, data that your CSI driver is accessing. Um, and it's already being used in some ephemeral CSI drivers like the secret store CSI driver that we mentioned earlier. Um, Another interesting uh, feature that we've done in 122 is uh, the read write once pod access mode. Um, so this feature went alpha in 122. And uh, this basically uh, fixes a common misconception about access modes in Kubernetes. Um, so the current read write once access mode that's available today um, indicates that a volume can be attached to one node at a time, but it doesn't actually um, indicate how many pods on that node can mount that volume. So with read write once uh, PDs today, you can actually have multiple PDs, uh, or sorry, you can have multiple pods scheduled on the same node um, and all be able to mount that volume. And that is um, sort of an unexpected surprise to um, a lot of applications there. And so now we have added this new read write once pod access mode, um, where we are actually able to enforce um, not only the single node for attach, but also that a single pod can mount, a uh, only a single pod can mount that volume. So um, yeah, that's a very interesting one to look for uh, look forward to in 122. Um, so I'm gonna go on to 123 now and talk about some of the things that we're doing there. Um, we are doing again, we're doing a lot of things uh, in 123 in the SIG. Um, so I'm only gonna highlight a couple of them here. Um, first, uh, we are planning to graduate two features related to FS group uh, to GA. So this first FS group feature is uh, called skip volume ownership. Um, this feature improves the time that it takes to mount volumes that have a lot of files in them by only updating the ownership of the files uh, when the top level directory owner doesn't match what the FS group says. Um, so for volumes that have thousands of files in them, we've seen in, in some cases that this feature is able to bring the mount time down from um, something that originally took 
more than 30 minutes um, and it brings it down to seconds. So this is um, a very important feature to enable in your pods if you're using FS group and you have and your volumes have a lot of data inside of them. Um, the next FS group related feature is called CSI FS group policy. This feature allows a CSI driver to explicitly opt into supporting FS group. Um, previously, without this, Kubernetes uh, uses a heuristic to determine which drivers um, will have FS group applied with them and um, the heuristic is a bit flawed in certain scenarios. So um, this feature allows the CSI driver to opt in explicitly. Um, and lastly, for our uh, GA graduation features, we are targeting generic ephemeral volumes, uh, which Shane introduced uh, earlier during this presentation. So I won't, I won't um, rehash that here. Um, I think moving on beyond 1.23, um, we have a number of features that are currently in prototyping and design phases. Um, so if you know any of these things sound useful to you, um, please uh, reach out to us and uh, reach out to us uh, via our mailing list or Slack channels, we'd be happy to um, discuss further on any of these, and if you want to be involved to the in the you know design discuss design discussions too. Um, in addition to these features, um, we are also working with other SIGs in Kubernetes to co-develop um, some other things. So um, we have in the data protection work group, um, we're working on a design for change block tracking. And this is pretty uh, important for enabling um, the ability to do efficient backups of volumes. Um, and then in SIG apps, um, we are collaborating with them to make some improvements to the stateful set PVC lifecycle. Um, and then SIG node, uh, we're working on this uh, initiative called Container Notifier. Um, which is important for the snapshotting feature to be able to quiesce applications before taking a snapshot. Um, and lastly, with SIG API machinery, um, we're proposing uh, this new uh, protection mechanism called uh, Lian to uh, prevent objects from being deleted while they are uh, still being used um, or taken by another object. So um, yeah, as you can see, we have a lot of projects going on in uh, various phases of design and implementation. If you're interested in learning more about any of these projects or you wanna help out, um, please join us in our six storage meetings, um, reach out to us on, in our Slack channel and we'll be happy to uh, discuss um, you know, any of these in more detail. All right, so thank you, everyone. Um, this concludes our session and uh, will be available for a Q&A after this. Thank you.